evening, one more present here, back from the Zavi Center of Historical Research, Arthur Pororori, who are today's evening SPR lecture on curatorial approaches to understanding Angelo de Fonseca's Madonna, presented by Dr. Sagar Vegas, on the theme, Angelo de Fonseca's Indian Madonna, an exhibition of selected paintings at the XCHR Museum. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Sagar Vegas amidst us to present her lecture, having curated exhibitions of the past at XEHR of the paintings of Goa's renowned painter and maestro, Angelo de Fonseca. Dr. Sabha will enthuse us with his maestro's depiction of Mother Mary to understand how the artist created an Indian Madonna. I also welcome Dr. Vishwesh Kandrothar, the Associate Professor of the Goa College of Architecture, who will be moderating this video. I hope to inform you all of you present here that this talk is going to be broadcasted through our channel, our YouTube channel at XCHR. Without further ado, now I'd like to call Dr. Vishwesh Kamrathal to introduce our speaker. paintings for the church. I handled his originals 
and I know that he walked in close tandem with the church to create a new vision for India. A new mother Mary would be Indian in color, in culture, and in landscape. was a strong fan of Angelo de Fonseca. Angelo often said that it was he who arranged the second marriage of Mr. Ketkar to the South African lady who was, uh, who was staying at the ashram where he lived. That is the child, uh, and uh, Ivy's child and Angelo de Fonseca's child, yes or no, who often appears in his face. Angelo de Fonseca paint. He says it took me some 40 years while looking for various Italian drawings and historical and archaeological sculptures that it struck me as to why the universality of Christianity could not be expressed, expressed in illustrative forms particular to each nation. And that is what drew Angelo de Fonseca to painting the Madonna and Christian narrative in Indian form. Um, I did not mention about his association with JJ College, but when we went to Calcutta, there were various artists who played a very important role in his life. But besides the artists, there were several muses who encouraged him or encouraged his pursuit of a Madonna figure. You see here, this is his niece, Alice Foster, who was married with Kaimura. And you see her as Mother Mary in several of his paintings, which I will uh, show you further, a little later. Besides Alice, there was uh, Isabel Consisam. Isabel Consisam was a niece from another uh, sister, his elder sister, who was married in South Goa. Isabel Consisam appears also in Mother Mary in several of his paintings. When he went abroad for two years, from 1948 to 1950, met somebody called Ilish Kilian. When I was doing my research on Angelo de Fonseca, Ilish Kilian got in touch with me and she said, she was in an old age home, and she said, you know, I knew Fonseca when he came to Ireland and he did several sketches of her which she sent me, uh, not the originals, but she sent me the copies. And she said that, uh, you know, he always wrote to me and said that I have red color hair, so I am going to paint you as Mary Magdalene. And this is a Fonseca painting of Irish Kelian done when she was 22 years old. Painted her as Mary Magdalene in a lot of the Lenten series, which 
show Christ going to Calvary. Now, more important, I want to talk about his artist mentors. One of the main mentors when he went to West Bengal was Abhinindranath Tagore. Abhinindranath Tagore did a six month course for novices, students in Bengal. And Angelo de Fonseca was a student at this course. He may have visited Shanti Nikitan, which, which had an art school, but it was more free willing at that time. And there is no record that Angelo de Fonseca studied at Shanti Nikitan. But according to scholars who have worked at Shanti Nikitan, the art stream that comes through in the work of Angelo Fonseca is decidedly from Shanti Nikitan. Because very often he wrote and expressed himself very clearly saying that I was a student of Abhinindranath Tagore and I am a student of the school of Bengal School of Revivalism. Obviously hinting that he was a student of Abhinindranath Tagore. But more importantly, at this time, the Bengal, Bengal was in a state of uh, new ferment and lots of artists were visiting from Japan from Southeast Asia to create what is called a new Asian model, countering the colonial model of art which was very academic. And it all began in West Bengal. And interestingly, as later developments will show, that uh, at this time there was a great apprehension in Europe and the Western world that Japan was becoming a very strong political entity in Asia. It had also started colonizing surrounding lands to begin with China, um, uh, Philippines and a lot of surrounding territories and they were afraid that China was trying to, I'm sorry, Japan was trying to expand and create a new kind of Asiatic colonialism. This was a fear that also uh, encouraged a lot of counter steps in European circles. which is called Spring, it's on display downstairs and it's painted in 1939. The years that Angelo Fonseca spends in West Bengal are right up to the early 30s when he migrates back to Goa. There is a painting by Abhinindra Nantago which is called Siddhis of the Upper Air. Upper Air. That painting has a lot of similarity with this and obviously it is Angelo de Fonseca who was influenced by his master's painting in terms of color, in terms of energy, in, in terms of the um, stratosphere where it is located, there are a lot of patterns. There's a painting of Sujata and Nautama Buddha by uh, Abhinindranath Tagore, and you will find that this painting, which is done in 1946, several years after Anjali Vinceka comes back from West Bengal, has a lot of parallels. This one is called Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ, but if you look at the supplicant attitude of uh, Mary Magdalene, if you look at the whole sitting arrangement of Christ, the lowest to me, in the mudras, you will find that there are parallels between this and um, uh, the painting that is done by Abhinandranath uh, um, Another strong influence on his work was the work of Eric Gill. Eric Gill was a British sculptor. He also lived in a commune. Um, he lived in a commune and he, he 
fact, there's a lot of artwork on the British uh, BBC building. Uh, he painted a lot of holy works, and the most interesting influence was that they were linear drawings and they were on black paper with white chalk. And you will find that there's a whole series influenced by Eric Gill, which Fonseca also does. Eric Gill later on came into a lot of disrepute for other reasons. His recent exhibition in Britain was banned. But he uh, was introduced to Angela de Fonseca through Ananda Kumaraswamy, who was a good friend of the artist, Eric Gill, and maybe even uh, uh, Monsignor Malin Font who was himself an artist. This whole series is influencing. Now, if you look at the linear work, it's so beautifully done. In fact, there was a 1934 wrapped up in a Calcutta paper where Angelo de Fonseca had displayed. And they said that he had the Botticelli line. His lines were so superb. They just a linear drawing, he could bring out expressions, he could create artwork of great sensitivity and uh, unsurpassable beauty, which you also notice in some of his works. Uh, I have to bring to your mind that many of these works are not done on expensive paper, they are done on ordinary chart paper. And even then, both the paints and the paper have defied age because they are still in excellent condition. This whole series belongs to that. Another very strong influence that comes on um, Angelo de Fonseca very consciously is that of Abdul Rehman Jukta, a art Jukta. He was also an artist of the Bengal school and I am not able to reproduce his paintings here, but this is a Fonseca work. But one of the strong things that both he and Chuktai emulate is the Mughal window. The Mughal miniaturist tradition was a very strong influence on uh, Chuktai. And he created these very dreamlike figures, which you will find three of them exhibited downstairs as we speak. Same work. Uh, similarly, another work which has a strong Chukai influence is a work that goes back to 1940 and it's a work of the old smell where um, Chukai has a similar work. So, uh, Anjali Dupon-Sekha was in conversation not only with Western artists but he was in conversation with several Indian artists whose artwork he found encouraging and he also emulated some of their qualities into his work. The other strong influence that is palpable all through his work, right from 1931 to 67 when he dies, is the influence of Jamini Roy. Uh, Angela de Fonseca never acknowledged the influence of uh, Jamini Roy. In fact, Jamini Roy was more with the communists than he was with the school of revivalism in West Bengal. So, uh, uh, but if you see the frontality of his figures, especially his Madonna images, you will find that there is a strong influence of uh, Jamini Roy. Now we come to a very crucial part of his work, the Indian Madonna. Uh, his earliest work can be dated to 1931. That is when uh, he just about leaves West Bengal and creates some <coughs> fleeting parting uh, shots, images. Many of them are worked in Madhun Jehu Kala and they are not here today. But one of the images that I can recap for you is a work I'll show you later on. But his earliest phase is from 1931 to 1948. Um, I would like to note here that all of the three phases of his work, that's the early phase, the middle phase, and the mature phase, you will find works of unsurpassed beauty. Okay? 
But at the same time, there is a kind of language he is developing right from the early phase to the middle phase to the mature phase and this language becomes very strident and outspoken in the final stage of his activity, especially from 1962 to 67 when he finally dies. 67 becomes a very productive year in which uh, he creates fabulous work. On what basis do we arrive at this division? Why does a curator follow this division? Perhaps you have come across the division for the first time. There are reasons why, because having been familiar with this work, I feel that up to 1948, the influences that he encapsulates are in the 1948 to 1950, Angelo Fonseca goes abroad first to attend the Lambeth conference and uh, it extends his visit right up to 1950. During the course of these two years, he uh, travels all across Europe, that is uh, England, Ireland, uh, Germany, France, Spain, Italy and Portugal. And during these two years, I think he absorbs a lot of European influences. He also is able to kind of read a lot of the images that he is populating. So when he comes back, his uh, images take a new birth and you see a different change in pattern. His dexterity of life was always there right from 1931. But when he begins the new work in 1951, there is a change which you will see in the exhibition. The mature phase starts from 1958 after the birth of his daughter. For a small state, there is a lot. And 1962, he starts painting older people, especially his sisters, relatives. He also paints people from the street, people he knows in the colony. There are lots of sketches. And suddenly from 1965 to 1967, there is a new language in his art. This language is strident. It's indeed, it's not blessed as the paintings of the 50s, which adhere to the norms of Christianity. But there's a certain departure, there's an inner energy which brings in a lot of Indian influences as well as brings in new color schemes. So now coming back to the portrait of Gita Roy in 1931, this is the work of Gita Roy. Now, if you look at this work very closely, you see a very strong influence of Moktiviani. You see the distension of the shoulders. And there is a little flaw, which I like to call the Fonseca flaw. Because if you should see the building of the shoulders or the articulation of the shoulders, there is a, a collapse, which is very much in the line of how Mogdiniani paints his female figures. There are some works of 1932 which are not included in the exhibition and which are not part of the Zedo's collection. But I would like to show it because it shows that even very shortly after 1931, he was creating works of unsurpassed and remarkable beauty. This one. is God the Father and it's a beautiful image done in watercolors. There's a companion piece to it which is called Urdhava Mulla, which is not in the collection of Xavier Center. It's from another collection known by some of the others. This is called the Tree of Life Upside Down. And if you look at the creation of the leaves, the creation of the figures, it's a work of immense delight and you realize that even at that early stage from 1931 to 1934, just 
for four years. Anjali Fonseca is such a consummate artist. But in these early works, Christian, especially from the Christian narratives, there is a placid, uh, placid expression of the color scapes in the background. There is a kind of explanation of cosmos which is very peaceful, which changes later on as he advances in life. This is also an early work which is not in the Xavier's collection and it is called Mother of India. Mother of India actually takes the idea of the peacock. The, 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 the throne is built from the idea of the peacock as well as Mother Mary's sari also takes on the qualities of the peacock mode, the feather motif. And it's a work of unsurpassed beauty. Now we come to a very important stage in his life, 1938. Besides the artist mentors, the mentoring of two important people was very crucial to the development of his art and its propagation of Christian narrative figures. This was Father Henry Haras, a Jesuit, who meets him in 1938 and over tea at the ashram where he lived, they born. And it is after this that Angelo de Fonseca uh, enhances his, uh, his concentration on creation of the Christian narrative. He could have been a saloon artist, he could have been a secular artist, because his painting style was fabulous. But he chooses to be a creator of sacred uh, images and I think he is by that time very passionate on creating a pantheon of Christianity which is totally unique in culture, color and landscape. Now if you notice this particular work, there is something that tells you about how his style is changing. If you look at the two hands, can you see the two palms? Can you see the two palms? I'd like you to concentrate your attention on the right palm and the left palm. The left palm is that of a icon, religious icon. Whereas the right palm is that of a palm hand, palm hands palm. This is a beautiful figure of Mother Mary, which is owned by Xavier's uh, Eras Center in Bombay. It was gifted to Father Eras. And it's the time when his whole new imagery starts changing. Later on, you will find that he creates, he calls himself an iconographer. Iconographer, and he says, Who's an iconographer? Basically, an iconographer takes back to correct from Angelico the icon painters of Turkey and other uh, icon painters from the 13th century and the 16th century in Europe. Basically, they make figures which were not known to bear. The images were beautiful but ethereal and icons were supposed to be connecting people on earth with the cosmos, with the gods in heaven. So they were intermediaries, icons were intermediaries. They communicated with God and they communicated with human beings. So slowly we will find that Angelo starts polishing the iconographer's craft. Later on we will find that his main concentration comes on the face and the hands. And when you see the body in entirety, you will find that it is not low well. Now this particular exhibition gives you an understanding of how the human image of Mother Mary, uh, how the image of Mother Mary developed. And that's very important for his work because slowly we find that aspects of holiness which I am emphasizing on become very, very manifest in his work. Now, the other important influence which Father uh, Evans introduces him is Monsignor Celso Constantini. Monsignor Celso Constantini was 
person of the ship and then a cabin of it. But he played a stellar role in Europe during the wars and he was very close to Pope Pius XII. He was in fact part of the think tank of the Vatican. And uh, this is a very interesting quote from an article that he writes in um, uh, Arte Christian, which is a better magazine that uh, Constantini himself started and continues even to this day. He says, I introduce Fonseca to Fra Angelico and wrote to him uh, and sent these pictures because the painter must conform to the Western style, but because I want him to see how the great master of the West now, at this crucial juncture, where uh, Constantini is writing to uh, Angelo Fonseca and writing about his work in European magazines, in Italy and in Spain, Europe is on the purpose of the Second World War. It's already been devastated by World War I and there's a Second World War about to begin. And it has set up the antennae of the Vatican because they feel uh, uh, that if this can happen to Jews in Europe, what will be the fate of decolonized Asia? And it's a fear that is not ill-founded because there are already murmurs of the freedom struggle happening in India. Okay? Um, this is a work that uh, was perhaps one of his iconic creations. And um, this uh, creation was put in a church in Pune. But later on, they found that Mary's expression was too sweet. And in fact, this was the expression that some of the uh, Celestial priests were working in the churches felt that Mary has to have a certain compassion, Mary has to have a certain um, beauty, she has to have a certain kind of dignity about her, which was an understanding that came from several of the conventions that happened in the church. And uh, so uh, at some point of time, Irene found when the church was being renovated, she found it outside, Irene's wife. And she brought this particular work of her own, both a Hungarian painter to restore it and then donated it to Xavier's center. Now, if you look at 1938 and if you look at his work in 1942, there is a new kind of energy already building up in his church. Mother Mary is sitting in Parmasan. She is holding her lily, which is a symbol of her purity. But she is totally dressed in Indian colors and Indian clothes and Indian expressions. Now this is a work, again, the Annunciation, if you see. This dates back to 1953. Now there's a big gap of almost uh, 10 years or 11 years between the two works. And you realize that there is also a streak of similarity that runs through it. So this is one street of Angelo Fonseca that we will find that all pieces in terms of color, in terms of uh, in terms of conceptualization are in conversation with other pieces at a later point of time, though they may be totally unconnected. Now this law in 1952 uh, is a secular work. I brought this here because I wanted to show you how powerful his secular paintings were. And there's a whole archive of secular paintings which he never exhibited. Because for him, the Christian narrative of uh, building up an uh, ending uh, archive of Christianity was so vital that he did not concentrate on many of his secular works. This is again, you see the Indic uh, influence, 
You see also the colors are very, very clear. Instead of angels, you have Dwana Pala sitting at the bottom. And in fact, this is a recreation of Yashoda and Krishna. Okay? Now the next two works uh, were perhaps created, influenced by Um, Abhinandana's Arabian Nights. You see, the first work is untitled. The second one is uh, Virgin Mary, Madonna, it is called. The first work is untitled. This one is 57, but the first work is not dated. But you will see that the influences come from the same works because you will find that there is a levitation of Mary in the second work when she is the prize and also the first figure which I think is from Annunciation or Mary in Annunciation you will find there is a levitation taking place the effect when you look at the figure is very Mira like okay? but if you look at the hands do you notice something? the hands play in the circle do you notice anything? that they are both right hands there is no left hand here, if you see. And Fonseca doesn't uh, connect the floor. Later on, in an uh, interview, Arpita Das said that you know, when she does her work, she just paints the hands and she doesn't then later rectify it there in the wrong place. So I think it was something similar with Fonseca. You notice that in the painting of Gita Roy, you also notice this in the painting of the painting of the pronunciation. Now again this work takes off from the Italian school and very strong influences. This is um, um, Santana and instructing Mother Mary. The uh, next one is a visit to her cousin. I'll go very quickly because I don't want to break father's movie. But see the kind of influences that come to you. From across India, this is very South Indian, so is the work Tamilian in the next work. Here, this is a very iconic painting, and nobody has commented on it before because this is painted in 1954 and it says Mother Mary being led to the temple. And you can see that this is the precincts of the temple. So, at this time, the whole duo of mother and daughter was being played out in terms of India and Goa because in 1954 the constitution was already made, the states were being divided on linguistic basis and Goa was not still free from the Portuguese in 1961. So and there were also plays written on the same theme. There's a play by Asim Karim Boy who says Goa 1906 Goa which talks about the same thing, about a young girl who is born to Signora Miranda but who is deaf and dumb, obviously referring to Goa, which is still not liberated. Okay, then I'll go on to the next work. Now in this work, this is Mother uh, Mary is ascended to heaven. You will find that again, you will find uh, the Dwarapala is bringing up and up to heaven. And what is important is the new kind of paradigm that Andrew Fonseca develops. Mother Mary is shown with purple hair. She is shown directly looking into the face of the viewer, which was not part of the Catholic brief at that time. Because according to uh, several uh, meetings with the church leaders that had taken place, they did not want saints and holy rulers to look directly at the viewer because that would fuddle up the understanding of the role of the high God in their lives. But here Fonseca kind of does these little interventions which create a modern understanding of Christianity again the work of 1955. Now, a lot of Fonseca's works address to two different social stratas. One is the Indian working class 
or the Hindi working class and the other was the elite class. If you look at some of the writings of his biographers of that time, especially Father Ledgerly, he says that he was actually writing for the elite classes of Christians because most Christians who understood Christianity and the teachings of Christianity were the elites, the others were followers. But Fonseca had a foresight which allowed him to think that Christianity also included people from the poorer segments. And many of his drawings, not particularly this one, this one is Hindi, but this one you find is very Christian, very good. And uh, many of his look at the street cultures of Pune, and you can find very often Mother Mary in Annunciation, Madonna Vinchai is positive in the street cultures of Pune. Now, if you look at this figure very closely, I told you about the views. Alice Pereira Costa. She was his equal in age because Angela de Fonseca was the last of 17 children. And she was the daughter of his eldest sister, Helen. And they got off very well. She was married in Plano. That's how I know her. She was my neighbor. And she was this very status, dark beauty. But when he paints her in 1959, she's almost 60 years old. But she appears as a young mobile girl of maybe 15 or 16. So that brings me to the point when posting through his work, when looking through his work, I find that Angelo de Fonseca does paint people's faces, does paint faces of women he meets in the street, faces of a lot of his relatives, but in the brief that Constantini offers him, he propagates that brief and he says, I don't paint for thoughts of people. I paint after I concentrate, say a prayer and concentrate on holy things. I do not want secular things to disturb my concentration on the holiness. This is a quote directly from Fonseca's writings. But you find that when you look through his work, that is not true. In many ways, I feel privileged because I have known Alice, I've seen photographs of Alice, I've seen members of her family, and I've seen the resemblance in many of his paintings to her. The last one, Ascension of Mary, Mother Mary, is again an Alice of an older age. And here in 1955, is Alice of a very young age. So what he does is he paints from memory. But it's totally not true that he doesn't observe. Features are observed very well and then recaptured at a later point in time. In fact, after he married his wife in 1951, lots of the people from the Christian community uh, said that, you know, Angelo, how can you paint your wife as Mother Mary and expect us to worship her? as if she's a holy person. And that is one of the resisting points for them to his works. But then he gave a strong reply to that. He says, do you really think that all the painters before me, including St. Luke and other well-known painters, they saw a vision of Mary and painted? This is many painters in the history of art have painted women have been their wives or who have been their mothers or who have been their sisters. And they, what is important in this is not who you paint, but how you paint and how well you capture the essence of motherhood. So going on from here to the next work, again, these Paintings after this show sorry, show people in prayer. There's a young girl and there's a woman. So the point I'm making earlier that he was actually addressing two kinds of believers. One was the Catholic upper class, the other was the working class. 
and when you juxtapose some of these paintings which are a similar theme, you are able to understand that point very well. Now, up to 56, uh, 1954 is the International Maria Year. So he creates a lot of images of Mother Mary and Child because there's a lot of demand for those images of God. But after that, there's a love in his work which catches pace. 1957, his daughter is born. So there are lots of images of the young baby. After 1962, he starts painting a lot of his older sisters. Catches their expressions. These are two of his sisters. I'm not telling who they are. You have to buy the book and you have to possess the book. That's why. There's another sister, again, who he paints. And the lady behind her is uh, Maria Patsisam, the daughter. So after this period, there's a new kind of energy that comes to this paintings in the 60s. Um, this painting, I'm trying to show you. Just bear with me, look at it and later on I can explain to you. Uh, this is a work of the 1940s, that's work of the 60s. You can find slowly is moving his legs. Creating a composite image where Mother Mary has not only Indian features but she has the universal features. Maybe some of them are Western, some of them. So, what I like to call this is a composite figure which has integral Indian elements but also Western elements. And the reason for this is not too far to see. There is an organization that was started by the Jesuits called Arte Indiana. Um, and they would make Christmas cards like we do downstairs, like this institution does, the Xavier Center of Historical Research. So, and uh, Father Lenny clearly says that when they are selling paintings of Indian painters, the Indians don't like to buy them. They prefer to buy Western paintings, Christmas cards made from, with Western figures. Whereas foreigners love to buy Indian painted figures of the nativity as Christmas cards. So I think slowly towards the 60s, Fonseca realizes what is the real picture and therefore he alters the image. This is again Mary descending from the dragon. I will explain to you now, but look at the mandolas, look at the energy in this painting. Suddenly there's a shift in the 1960s and you realize a lot of big features, lots of Southeast Asian features of art have been absorbed to create imagery that is truly Monsecre. Now I went to visit one of his sister's homes in South Goa where they told me that, you know, once Monsecre was visiting, and he asked for a piece of cloth because one of the sisters was a very good painter and she would sit on the machine and her minor would sit on the tree. Okay. So he asked for a piece of cloth, he tore it into pieces and he painted her with the birds sitting on the shoulder. Okay. And later on, in 1967, I came across St. John the Baptist and St. John the Preacher, two wonderful works which carry essence of this particular painting that he had done, this sister. Here the figures are much older. There's a new kind of energy, breathtaking in its visualization of the cosmos, which you don't find in his earlier paintings. And so also see the coloration in the background landscape of the next painting. Similarly, another work of 1965, which was a painting that was housed in every dining room in Kerala at the time that Pansipa was around. It is a startling painting. You've never seen a horizontal visualization of the Last Supper. And it's very Indian people. They're sitting on the floor, they're eating from thalis, and you find ears and 
other forms of ornamentation in place in the houses also in this. There's a lot of new energy that comes into these paintings. At the same time, he's also creating a composite mother. Uh, as a curator, I found it very necessary to look at certain paintings, like this one was untitled. Many of his paintings are untitled. How does one interpret them? Somebody had interpreted or written before me about whether said this is Madhavar. It can't be Madhavar because no one can say Madhavar. You never show Madhavar very directly. But this is the year that he died. His daughter and his wife, and I think many of his relatives who I interviewed said that at that time he was very perturbed because his mother died when he was 10, and he also died when his daughter was 10. So something was disturbing him about her future in their life together, and he put it in that painting. Um, now I'll go very quickly with this because I would like to observe the time scale. Lots of influences of the freedom movement, portraits, agitations, the kind of clothes people go come across in this war. You see that Congress women, they did not wear jewelry but they wore long sleeves and kanda. And you could almost imagine this as a uh, Congress woman with an activist who was following in the theatre that they the same message is carried on in these other paintings. Very often we show Swami Vivekananda and many other religious leaders of the time as Jesus Christ. Okay, here you find Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore show in a house. Okay, similarly you find Christ wearing very unique clothes in a lot of the formulations. A very strong influence that comes across in his work is also the work of Bureau Monastery in Germany. Many of these conceptualizations come from the conceptualization of Bureau Monastery icons in, in the monastery. Okay? Okay. Um, I would like to end with a last quote from Celso Constantine, Constantine who says that the painter must be Indian and yet he must express new concepts, Christian concepts. His art, while remaining truly Indian, should introduce new conceptual elements so that the pictures will represent a Renaissance Indian movies. The Christian thought should not suffer in any form. Thank you very much. I know uh, you feel that you're doing New beginning is, is kind of you can question whether even though you have done a new beginning, a possibility of seeing the world. So uh, I think that's that's very interesting topic. But there are so many things that you touch which is which is quite good to know and think about. So I think as I was looking at the timeline, the very things which were going through my mind. Uh, there is a kind of a odd connection between biography and history. Oftentimes, uh, historians kind of say that the biographers are not so valuable because they don't tell the story and it's not interesting. But uh, biographers, especially of artists or important person, can reveal something about the period which even history cannot. So, in that sense, the, the work that you bring out about Fonseca tells so much about. Not just about India, uh, or India, which is uh, British India, which is trying to become about the period where uh, India has its independence, provides opportunities, will face much greater, and then the post-colonial Goa, which is another another thing, and all of these kind of curves of timeline where all these things come together is the timeline where Anjou Sunsika is doing his hard work. And once trying to uh, find form to his figures, but also trying to find a particular context in which to express his figures. And I think that's something which is amazing to uh, 
think about the future of young people bringing up. Uh, that's what I thought was quite interesting part from many things now, including this year, scheme to association, scheme to It's one of the What I will do is I will uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, I would request uh, questions to be brief, perhaps in few sentences, questions which can uh, add the speaker time to answer them. I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but when you were speaking about the hand, the right hand being on the top and the bottom, is it possible, like when you're playing an instrument, your hand moves? So is it possible that the right hand was in both places because he could not show the movement? Yes, it's possible, but uh, I found the painting very intriguing because he doesn't change it, he doesn't title it, he doesn't date it, but if you look at his entire move from 1931, to 1961, which would be like, like 500 images, it's one of the works which stands out in its energy and in its ability to combine a very Indian idea of ecstasy through music, through the ecstasy which probably he connects with the Annunciation. When Mary is in a state of confusion because she receives the heavenly grief that she is with child. So no other external expression brings the angel to deliver that grief, but is entirely conveyed through the expression of the hands and the face. And the, the levitating carpet, which I have reasons to believe, because there is a correspondence between me and Abhinandra Nantago, that he followed Abhinandra Nath's work very closely. Because there are postcards which say, now I'm painting the Arabian Nights, now I'm reading the Christian Bible, which is essentially Abhinandra Nath's uh, correspondence to him, to the artist. And so I think that idea of levitation comes from that Arabian Nights. Okay? But yes, you make an interesting point. He was probably painting the hands first because when you're painting icons, and this is a work of the middle stage, it's from 1951 to 57. So it's obviously a work in which he is conceptualizing very advanced ideas, but something happens and it doesn't go through. But nonetheless, it's a work that stands out. Because, like you're saying, the whole idea of music can be shown by a moving man that doesn't um, obey the law of the human body. And Fonseca was a master of the understanding of the human anatomy because he briefly flirted with being a medical student. He did one time and dropped out for health reasons. And in one time, he had scored the highest in anatomy. But later on, if you look at his figurations, all his works, especially of the Madonna, and even the other works of the same cellar, they all are in circles, ovals, squares, and rectangles. If you follow that principle, you can define his entire field. But he probably did it in a matter of a minute. I mean, in that sense, he was very much like Jamini Roy. Because Jamini Roy created a public archive of works. He would go to somebody's house, do a quick sketch, and present it. And so also with Angelo de Fonseca. There are many uh, evidences that he would visit somebody, make a sketch, leave it behind, and he would become a valuable 
mentor and a work of value of that visit and relationship. But to me, I'm sorry to refer, to me that, that does look like a left hand. To me, let's say you just referred to the left hand does look like a left hand. It looks like a thumb to me. So I don't think it's too high hand the thought, but that's me. I, mean, I don't know how much I scored the hand to me when I passed it. <laughs> but it looks like a left hand to me. But it's, it's disjointed under the under the song. Yes, yes. First, uh, well, thanks, Sakya, because I find when you talk about these meetings, each time I've heard it now so many times, you bring in new insight, just like Vishwesh said very well. What strikes me is this political interpretation, you know, that India was going through a crisis, India was looking out for freedom, you know, freedom units, and he was looking out, I think, for his Christian, Indian Christian identity. That's what I feel. Question. Do you think you can point out to any one painting saying that here is the moment he made a breakthrough and he felt, yeah, now this is my Christianity, then an Indian identity? It's a very important question coming from a religious person and I'll try to answer that. But maybe not with the majority of your understanding. There are several letters which have been preserved, not from Fonseca, but several ecclesiastics of Indian as well as European origin, who are constantly writing to Fonseca and telling him, you don't have to worry. Your work will last forever. Father Harris is one of them. Then there's another German gentleman. So also Father Lenin. He says you have created images for Christianity of lasting values. These will speak even after you are born. 1931 is the year he paints Gita Roy. But even in 1961, there is correspondence that comes from certain German ecclesiastics who say that you don't have to worry. You don't have to spend so much time on thinking that the priests who are running churches do not understand your idea of Christianity. There will come a day when they will begin to recognize and opt for your pictures rather than go for those sweet and ordinary pictures that come from the markets of Europe. There is also another reference which says that from Father Mellon Font, it's a letter, which says that uh, you don't have to worry. This time we had a meeting of bishops and senior priests and many of them were very receptive to the ideas of creating Christian images for worship in Hindi form. And they said, soon we will be able to make bigger breakthroughs. So these are very interesting insights that while the Vatican and number of enlightened Jesuits. I hold Jesuits very close to my heart because I like the fact that they are so close to Christ, so close to Mother Mary, and so close to you know ground realities on the ground. So they understood the need of the hour. Whereas I cannot point a finger at Celestial priests because you know Goa had just maybe the responses were from Goa and many parts of India. Bombayan, who uh, now has several goals were settled. India had just, uh, I mean, Goa had just come out through a very scarring inquisition. And inquisition had offered certain briefs to the Catholic layman as well as to the priesthood. So nobody wanted to violate those because under the inquisition, several things 
even already the therapeutic salt in your food was added to them. You could be, you know, seen as a violator for that. So that the scars of the Inquisition still lasted. So please, the priesthood that was responsible for churches that came from the um, teaching institutions like Russia, they would rather, you know, be an institution that gave mar red marriage bans and uh, baptized, married, and married people, rather than take, you know, very innovative and radical steps. So while you understand the lament of Fonseca, and you understand the forward-thinking steps of the Jesuits and the Vatican, you realize that the ground reality is something different. And history can explain that. So my role as a historian is to bring that out. I mean, I have no problem with calling Fonseca a modernist and ending my debate there. But for me, I have to explain these final lineaments that, you know, made him the kind of painter he was, made him despondent at times. But there is a rich understanding of the, of the labyrinth of history that we pass which can account for certain experiences for Fonseca, the Vatican, as well as for the lay for the priesthood. Two, there are two uh, historical moments which is interesting. One is in 31 32, uh, Portugal moves towards Estado uh, uh, So, in that sense, Portuguese is on extreme right trying to uh, reassert its uh, Christian identity. And in 62, like the Vatican Council, uh, in 16, 61, so like the Vatican Council reform. So, I'm sure that 62 onwards, the mature phase is also responding to trying to make. Christianity much more closer to the lady, and that must have influenced the Christian Church in the last place. But also, that is on the uh, some kind of background. There is this whole that, in fact, that uh, some kind of some kind of engagement which is coming on the way in which you can express the same kind of experiments in India and to establish the lady line in terms of reacting with those people which perhaps would have made it. Uh, Hi, and just back to the comment in the little hand. Uh, would it mean that the left hand is not good because Indians didn't consider being left handed um, suspicious or they kind of, like I know a lot of being left handed people who need to switch to the right hand because it was considered, I'm not sure what the word is, like the word for it is, but it was looked down upon. Could it be, I'm trying to just or he's not good. I mean, he was not very strong. But Sikha was very liberal. You know, he was, uh, in fact, Christianity did not believe in yoga. But if you see in his artwork, there are lots of uh, yogic asanas, yogic mudras, uh, dance mudras that come across very liberally. Even the whole thing of divine, uh, divine that of the open eyes. And if you go through my book, you will realize that there are references where um, people have spoken that he said that you know, Christ does not live only in a church. Christ can live in a trade union hall. Christ can live outside of the closed doors of the church. And interestingly, when he displays his work in Europe, many of these are small town halls, they are trade union offices where his artwork is displayed. So that way he was a non-conformist. So I don't think that he confined himself to the limits of tradition. But it's open to one day actually. It can be a right and a left hand which he placed. Because as I said, if you look at iconographs very often, the hands and feet of the icons are not weighed very they do not correspond to the larger structure of the body. That's because the face is supposed to be luminous, through which an icon communicates with the viewer. And these are just expressions. 
external and externalities, which you will find are very dry today. You will find they are very ethereal. The most important thing is the face. And I think he infuses that into his work on the image uh, Father Heras. There's also uh, a reason to believe that he considered Father Heras as his second father. He said he had a biological father, and his second father was Father Heras because he gave him a real spiritual and an intellectual life. So in many of his paintings, he shows Father Heras as the priest who goes to the local court, another place, another Spaniard priest. He showed the visit of Father Heras. One of the almost running out of time. Big last question. Sandhya, you may or may not want to answer this, it may be too long. But you keep mentioning um, the Inquisition and at the same time you also mention the Vatican. Can you give me a brief idea of the relationship between the two? But before we find out, uh, I would like to make a sincere call to everybody. You have to see the paintings. Secondly, very few artists' patrimonies are in the state. There is Ramona Navelka, there is Angelo de Fonseca, there is the Trinidad, FX Trinidad, and his daughter. They are both side poor. So I appeal to the ones to create their patrimony. These artists, many of these artists did not live here because the conditions were not conducive to paint and show their work here. But have respect for them, for the art that they created, for the state, and for the fact that you share a common heritage, genetic heritage with them. So let us take this art forward like on Zeta Walking, bring it to schools, bring it to colleges, bring it into the curriculum so that artists like him can live forever. Well said. Go on our list, uh, and I would also. Uh, the book is out. Yes. The book will be out. I will also appeal to engage with the books of any other forms. But thank you so much, it's been so much uh, pleasure and nice to know about the Seca, but also the passion to which you can every time you come on table, even though it is the three many times and taking that energy. So thank you so much for your energy. And I wish you can keep doing this, even if you have one more lecture, thank you. I promise you. I promise you that even if I have an audience of one, I will see. Thank you. Center of Historical Research and the Department of the South Wales. Thank you for your expertise in this lecture. I'm sure you've created a lot of interest, awareness, uh, a deep sense of the novel and strength of paintings. You know, right over the timeline, the background. So thank you very much, Dr. Sadia. I'd like to thank also Dr. Vishwa Shandukar for being there and always assisting us with the paintings. I think also with your insights. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all those who have put their heads and hearts in making this event a meaningful one. And last, lastly, I'd like to thank each one of you present here uh, for giving your time to listen to this lecture. I'm sure that you will go home very pleased. But before we do that, an announcement. The museum is now open for all present here. And I would like to request Dr. Sabra to take the audience uh, ready to guide the exhibition. So, uh, just to inform you, the museum will close by 8. So thank you and have a good night. <laughs>